Olueni. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. Today is National Day of Reflection, so I hope we take a moment or two to reflect on what I'm going to be speaking about tonight. Firstly, I just want to thank our audience who are here tonight, and also thank the audience online as the ones as well who are joining us from South Africa and around the world, I hope. This talk is in three parts. It's my personal background, it's, the, it's an overview of historical events and Black Atlantic. So as a researcher and writer, I want to reflect on all three. I'm not a historian, <laughs> uh, rather a custodian of my family name, memory, trauma, loss, and recount of genocide and theft of both my family and, if I may say, my nation in South Africa as in context of a diaspora as well. So I'm going to open with a poem, the uh, first one's called My Soul. I am an African child. An African child strives in the basking heat. Her hair is like silk, her skin the most beautiful treasure. She is majestic, regal, tall, and her teeth are so white. She is a poem, the poem in the Song of Solomon. So my name is Nandi Jola. I'm from the tribe of Amangosin and Amambondomese clan from the Eastern Cape of South Africa, which origins, uh, with origins from Tsolo, Gala, Kange, Kargut, and Port Elizabeth, or Kabeja, as it's known today. The name Kabeja is derived from the river which connects us as South Africa to the Great Kai and the Great Gamtus. And the Gamtus River is the most important river in terms of my historical talk tonight. So, in my roots, the first colonial British rule that is imprinted in me, in my DNA, is the change of my name. So my name is Yola, with Y-O-L-A, and later on it changed to Jola because of apartheid. So those who know South Africa or those who know myself know that the 24th of September is the most important date in South African history today because it's National Heritage Day. It's also my birthday. But also my name, because the name used to be, the, the day used to be known as the Shaka Zulu Day, which is now known as Heritage Day. But uh, Shaka was the most revered king of the Zulu nation who defeated the British in so many battles. But his mother, who trained him, was Nandi. So maybe that's where my name comes from. In fact, I think that's where it comes from. So my family and many other British, uh, many other black families in South Africa and parts of Africa were forcibly removed from their land, leaving behind family graves and praying sites to work in cities like slaves for capitalists. They built buildings that resembled Europe and therefore named them after the European masters. These included courts, which in return would later try and convict the very black people who wanted their land back. So the history of Port Elizabeth, just briefly, it's over 200 years now, but at the time, it was the British settlers who began the journey to the southern tip of Africa in 1820. 4,500 settlers landed in Algoa Bay. Many held their homes in search of a better, many left their homes here in the UK or Britain in search of a better future. Immigrants captivated by the government's promise of new life on fertile southern African land. The harsh reality of colonialization soon bent away the idyllic dreams of peace and prosperity. The British government subsidized the settlers into deceit. These families were placed on the, southern, on the South African frontier in the Eastern Cape to form a human shield between the Cape and the Kosa tribes. So that's just a brief history of Port Elizabeth. And Port Elizabeth is home to Queen Victoria statue, which is outside uh, the, the city library. So as I've said that I'm not a historian, all I'm trying to give is just an overview and maybe at the end of this talk, we'll have a, a chance to ask questions. So I'm just gonna quote a speech by uh, Joseph Chamberlain which he gave in 1895 when he said, I believe that the British race 
is the greatest of the governing races that the world has ever seen. So in briefly, uh, what he was maybe thinking at the time was that the saying that the, the British Empire is the empire that the sun never you know, set on. And in some ways that was true because when you think about the British Empire and you think about the colonization that they have done around the world, it was just in every land. So in South Africa, and coming back to South Africa, we had the Six Frontier Wars from 1834 to 1836 between the Khosas and the British, and sometimes known as the Yinsa War. Yinsa was the king of the Khosa people at the time. So the war broke in the Cape Government Commando, which was patrolled by the Ka River, and which was occupied by the Khakabe, which is another tribe and another clan name in, in South Africa. On December 21 in 1834, a large force of some like 10,000 Khakhabe Khosa people led by Makoma and Jai swept into the Cape Colony, devastated county between the Winterberg and the sea. Inza offered his moral support to the chiefs, but he never sent an army to assist them. So the British took advantage of this and they ambushed the men. In return, Inza was ordered to give away his cattle, which amounted to over 50,000 cattle, and he was killed in the battle as well. And the price for the British was to bring his head to England, which was never returned to South Africa. And South Africans still calling for the king's head to be returned. In 1795, back here in England, over three million plus people celebrated Queen Victoria's Jubilee Whilst in South Africa, around about that time, we saw uh, the brutality of Sar Batman, who was brought here by an English uh, surgeon. She was later exhibited in what we call the freak shows and later known as what we call today, or what was called the, the hot and hot Venus. The story of Sar Batman, so many years later, resonates today because so many women are brought here from, from Africa with the promise of finding glory or finding some dream that is in this land. But the reality is that they end up being sexual slaves and sometimes they end up dying in tragic circumstances. But in returning to South Africa, I want to talk about just briefly a girl called Nunga Wosa. Nunga was said to be an orphan and the niece of Mthlagaza, whose father was a chief. After, her mother, after Mthlagaza's mother died, he went to the Cape Colony and became familiar with Christianity. He returned to Kosaland in 1853. Nunga parents died in the Battle of Waterclough. As a result, she is believed to have quite conscious and aware of the tensions between the Kosas and the colonial forces. The Khosas were always experiencing an onslaught of attacks upon their community and institutions by British colonial authorities from as early as 1779. Moving on then to what is known maybe in here in the UK, the Zong Massacre, which was the mass killing of more than 130 African slaves or people that were, should, should we say, were enslaved by the crew of the British slave trip song on 29th of November, 1781. Again, this song massacre trial is very, is very popular because it was based here in, in, in Liverpool where the owners were seeking compensation, not the people that were on board, but the owners of the ship. And so many of these instances happening and throughout history, even uh, I think the last um, you know, when I'm here and I have to research these topics, but also thinking, people thinking that these are things that happened a long time ago, and yet these are things that people are still benefiting from today and the legacy of slavery, the legacy of apartheid, and the legacy of all these wars is not something that is acknowledged by the British colonial rule, 
but also what I think about when I go to South Africa as much as I return to South Africa is seeing how the people have lost out. My own family, we have lost the land which was the size of two football pitches, but also my grandfather, my grandmother, and also my mother, they have lost out on their pension because for black people there was no pension. So it was free labor, it was the discovery of minerals, it was, it was extracting them and it was bringing them on shore. And the labor, it was the black people. And yet, when we're talking about, for example, the Holocaust, there is an acknowledgement that some of the things that have happened were barbaric, there were genocides, there were, but when it comes to black people, we're always told to forgive and forget. So coming to present, the start of apartheid, which is 1948, and I call it to present because it's still ongoing. To me, apartheid didn't stop. And the reason why I say that is because all of the things that I've mentioned, the cattle, the theft, the genocides, the looting, nothing has been returned yet. So until everything has been returned or we have a dialogue about repatriations, then to me, the apartheid is still ongoing. The Black Atlantic. The black identity is difficult to define because or due to this intercultural and its multilingualism of blackness. The image of black Atlantic remains till this day, slave ships, drowning, sorrow and death, not what we know as Africans as royalty, scholars, travelers, traders. The black embodies the alternative histories and futures which fail to be addressed by stereotypes, propaganda, and lack of history in the curriculum. We should be able to see black bodies between two or more lands, identity, cultures, because if we don't, then this is an affirmation and tragedy to the real legacy of Black Atlantic. To me, Augusta Savage's work is true depiction of the image of Black Atlantic compared to Gilroy's slave ship images. Augusta is a witness, an extension of Black experience, which she is not defined by borders. Whereas Gilroy depicts Western nationalism from a narrative created by whites that ties Western nationalism to whiteness. This narrative inherently others Black people who often partly belong to the same national identity. It divides black people according to tribe, religion, region, language, rather than recognize that black people are a nation first than the other. I call black Atlantic people that are people that are everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Because for me, black people are always denied their existence. You hear that in England, people saying that black people only arrived with the Windrush, which I know as a Tosa person that we had Tio Soga who came here and was the first black man to translate the Bible from English to Tosa. So uh, I hope the pace is okay. I'm going to read uh, another poem, which is, um, it's called, I, I'm not racist, but... I'm not racist, I know. You are simply asking why. Why so many people want to come here to take your jobs and your homes when you have given so much to them, a penny every Sunday in church, at the corner, in the shop, in the trika box, with the black baby, them a penny, gold for you in return, keep digging, I keep a penny for you, sweet sugar, a penny, diamonds, a penny, coffee too, another penny, so you are not racist, I hear you. So, in concluding, I want to say that for me, the British invasions, the colonial rules, the trauma, and the theft brings me here. It brings me to become what I am in terms of writing and also researching. As maybe people don't know or realize that I grew up under apartheid, 
but also I was educated with the Bantu education, which limited my knowledge of what was going on. For example, when I was growing up, I didn't know who the queen was, and yet the queen is the head of, I don't even want to say that word. So there's nothing common. There's no common wealth to me. There's nothing common about sharing a queen for Africa and Europe. Because to me, when I look at the modern day slavery, the immigration struggles, the fees that immigrants have to come here from Africa and pay, compared to the free will looting and movement of British people in Africa, then there's nothing common about that. When I look and revisit the colonial past and I'm told that this is post-memory. To me, it's not. It's everyday memory. I'm reminded in every institution when I go back, even the city hall in South Africa looks identical to the city hall in Belfast. These buildings, these street names, all of these things, and the language that is evolving from a thousand years to what it is today when we're talking about shock and awe, which is obliteration of cities, when you're talking about collateral damage, which is killing of civilians, enhanced interrogation techniques, which is torture, and extraordinary detention, which is the state-sanctioned kidnappings and bringing democracy, which is a mass cultural reorientation. And all of these things I have experienced, and more my family have experienced it. So in closing, when people ask me, why I'm here. I'm always reminded by a quote of um, Frederick Douglass who came to Ireland and he said that the Irish who at home readily sympathize with the oppressed everywhere are instantly taught when they step upon our soil to hate and despise the Negro. Sir, the Irish American will one day find out his mistake. I wish that these words were not true and would not come to reality, but I've been here 20 years and I can say that uh, this to me is as true as it was back then. And the sad reality of it is that the Irish people always pride themselves that they never colonized anyone. But if you look at direct provision today, to me, that is colonization. Thank you. I'll take questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, today there's a there was a protest in England today about some people from the Caribbean demanding for compensation for what happened to the black people when it comes to slavery. Mm -hmm. And you actually touched on that as well. And my question is do you actually think compensation will be enough for the damage the British and the kingship in Britain based in Britain, Britain, to Africans through slavery? Thank you. Through slavery, and that's number one. And I also want you to put that in mind when you are answering that question. That was a few years ago, the Prince Charles was in Nigeria, and they asked him, when are you returning the artifacts stolen? From, from Nigeria and, and other parts of the African countries. Mm -hmm. And the response was shocking. And he said they won't be able to return it because Africa will not be able to keep them. So the question is, you saw them there, Africans built them, kept them for you to steal. So the question is not about they can keep it. The question is they kept it for you to steal. So with all that's been done to us, to the extent of beheading some of our kings because they want to take total control of our land, do you actually think compensation is what we should be asking for? And if it is so, do you think it is actually enough for what they have done? Thank you. Thank you. 
As a Kosa person, I need my land back, which was taken. I know there was a land program to give back the land and compensation in, in cases where the land cannot be given back because some of the land has been built on. But what is important, I, for me, it's the curriculum. Yeah, first of all, it needs to include, I know the will is not there because it will, you know, it will unveil so much. So, and the people that also, we have to think about the people who did all these, uh, these killings and these, you know, rapes and all this looting, it's their grandparents and they are still, you know, alive. Those, those, that generation is still alive. And I, there's a shame in that, you know, when you discover that it was actually maybe your grandfather or your grandmother who's done this. And how do you deal then with that legacy within yourself? But then that's, an, that's not for us as black people to, to think about or to decide how white people deal with what, what has happened in, in their generation. So in coming back to answering you, for me, what I would like as a Kosa person, first of all, is to have, a, you know, the, the head of the king returned because that is the most sacred thing. And for that to be ongoing for all these years, then that, that's, a, that's a crime, you know. And also to have this, those events documented in a way that is, is telling the, the, the truth, is calling what it is. So, for example, there were 20, over 23,000 uh, Africans that were killed in the British concentration camps in South Africa. And we had a ship that, uh, you know, that didn't make it to the World War I, which was carrying over 646 black men who were coming here to fight the war, the SS Mendy. And that, that ship, you know, it was in 1917 when that tragedy happened. But it was only 100 years later that it was acknowledged because of the pressure of people coming up like myself and other generations who are demanding the truth. So for things to be documented, first of all, and I, I don't know if, because I, don't, I do not think that um, it's just a matter of money, but it's, it's a matter of uh, looking at institutions who have benefited, for example, universities, and how in, in their strategy, what they are saying that they are decolonizing the curriculum. And when you actually, um, you know, when you're actually challenging how they are actually decolonizing the curriculum, it's just a tokenism thing. But also, uh, I mean, for me, what I'm doing is that I'm putting together, uh, you know, a compilation of essays that published this poetry collection, but I'm, I'm also, you know, researching and writing and documenting so that it's here. And, you know, people cannot say no, but that maybe it's, 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 it's inaccessible. It's in Africa. It's here. So that my, my generation and their children and their children will have access to it here in, in Ireland or Northern Ireland or in the UK. So I think also it's our responsibility as black people to read and to write because I, I, I don't know whose code it is that if you want to hide something from black people, you, you, you hide it in a book, which means that we don't read enough. I hope that's answered your question to some extent. Yeah, uh, that answered my question, and thank you, and thank you very much for your for your response. And it's just that when the when it comes to putting the narrative there, there's a way in which they can put the narrative on our behalf, which might not actually reflect our composition and what our intellect can interpret. Uh, I asked that question about compensation because for me, I don't see how we can actually quantify the compensation that we are even talking about. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of killing were done, which is murder, okay? And I actually expect people like you and those who are advocating for this to actually call those who perpetrated that fraud and that crime, okay, to be prosecuted. So this is kind of composition, somebody like me we, we, we support. Because if you kill somebody, if you behead somebody, that's murder. And such generations or that institution or those people perpetrated that should be identified. Yeah, it's and important as well for us as, as people who are pursuing this work to have it, you know, a factual, to have it recorded, to have it documented so that uh, myself and other writers have the actual, or even try and have as, as, as closer to the truth as we can get. Because uh, some of this work is very hidden, and most of it, it's, it's not, it was not meant for us as black people to access it. And now that we are here, we have free access 
Sometimes we have free access through the libraries and records office, and sometimes we have to request the information. So it's time consuming. Just the poetry book alone that I wrote, it took me just nearly 10 years just to research the materials just so I have the correct information. So it's time consuming, but I think what needs to happen for me anyway as a writer, because I don't have powers to, to, to ask the queen to give back the diamonds. I don't have those powers, but I can document that where the diamonds came from. And then if we have that as a collective, then we have, I, I think we have a strong case to say this is what you know, has been documented. And then we are calling for a genocide to be called a genocide, for example, or we are calling for the, the you know, for example, the institutions like Queen's University to decolonize the curriculum. And how are they doing that? Then we, you know, because we can have that call when we have the work done and the evidence. Thank you so much, Nandi. This was really fabulous. And uh, I guess that my question sort of builds off of what he was saying too, um, because as an anthropologist and writer, I'm interested in these things. Um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more about reparations and repatriation like in the context of museums. So like specifically, how could museums decolonize and you know, build ethical relationships with communities? Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Hmm. I don't know about ethical when it comes to museums. I don't, I don't think there's anything ethical about museums. But um, what I, I, I personally think, and I've been uh, part of this, was to take part in like an interview. And in this interview, I wanted to make sure that it was recorded that I'm calling for these things not to be stored, but to be sent to where they belong. So for example, I know that Alstom University has got a big project that is coming up, and that is to asking people, which I think again is exploiting you know, Africans, asking them what are these things, can you identify them, and then they're gonna store them. So for me, it's still not genuine, you know, because they will be named, and then what? If then there's a process in the end to say, okay, we will return them. And to come back to your question says these things, we, we, they, they won't know what to store them. We didn't have museums in Africa because knowledge is shared, right? These things were dug up, they were meant to be buried. <laughs> so they were not meant to be dug up and put in museums. So some of the things are sacred, some of the things have uh, they've got souls, and some of the things are very important in terms of culture and uh, identity of people. So if we're gonna keep them you know, behind a glass where they are speaking behind those glasses, we are prolonging the healing of the people. We are prolonging the actual identity of the people. No wonder many Africans you know, struggle to find healing amongst their own nation and amongst themselves. It's because some of their culture and some of their belonging is somewhere else and it's not where it's supposed to be. So for me, that is the most important thing when we're talking about museums and how ethical they are because some of the artifacts that are actually in the museum are breathing and they are demanding to be sent back. <laughs> thank you thank, thank you, you so much Nandi because I would agree that I think that looting unfortunately like forecloses the ability to ever end mourning you know or grieving so yeah thank you thank you uh, thank you Nandi very much for a, a really moving um, piece so my question is really about, I don't even know how to frame it really, but it's about kind of trauma. Mm. And you talked about trauma involved in um, colonialism and colonial incursions and about the Atlantic slave trade um, and also about um, forced migration now. But you referred at the beginning as well to your own trauma. And I wonder, I just want to ask really, are there bits of that trauma that you find easier to talk about and bits of it that you find less easy to talk about in public? You know, you talked about the kind of history of trauma yeah. and yeah. inherited trauma. Can you talk a bit more about how, um, how you feel about inherited trauma and how that expresses now? Yeah, so... Um 
Anesu, who is my daughter at the front here, she said something which I can't remember, but she said about uh, you know the grandparents who educated their children and then their children become artists. You know, it's like uh, the artist is the one who's going to tell all and it's going to air out the dirty laundry. And I, 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 I'm sorry to be like that in my family, but I, I think it needed to be said and it needed to be documented. So I, I've, I'm okay talking about trauma because I've healed from the trauma. I've removed myself from when I'm researching stuff and then I can go away and put it, or when I'm finished with it, I can put it away and close it and then move on to the next thing. So in terms of looking at my own trauma and the trauma of my family and what I've passed on and what was passed on to me, I can see where it's coming from. Whereas before I, I, I was, uh, you know, in academia, I, I, I was angry, I was hurt, you know, I hated all white people, so I didn't know how to deal with the trauma. And for me, the best way to deal with it was to feed from the hatred. So now I can, uh, I can research, I can detach my feelings, so I'm okay to talk about trauma. The whole book is traumatic, it's my traumatic experiences. So I, I feel that it's complete, and then I can move on to something else. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, no roses here, did you? <laughs> Hi, Rosie. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I've been really moved by what you're speaking of, and I have been to South Africa a few times as part of the trauma team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really important. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if we can put a GoFundMe, I'm only joking. Um, so I have had people like yourself, Rosie, who I've known over the years, who have been supportive. Everybody that I have met, I have made it very clear what my background is and what my circumstances are, and I've made it very clear that I would. At the time, I wanted to go back to university and I wanted to research the stuff and I wanted to have books published and available for the next generation. And so I think I'm on track, but if you know people that are in power, for example, that I can have a conversation with and I can have a meaningful dialogue, because until I have a meaningful dialogue, then to me it's all about you know, tokenism and all that there. And it took me a long time to realize that I was actually going round in circles until I had started documenting and researching and spending that time, which contra you know, it, 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 it contradicts what I'm trying to do because you spend so much time you know, excluding yourself from people and you spend so much time digging up and things that you've already healed from. But uh, there's been a lot of work that has been done. I have to commend that. But uh, the diamonds are still here. <laughs> Unfortunately, the British Museum is still holding these artifacts. So I don't know what we need to do, whether we need to have uh, an affirmative action where we just go as black people and, <laughs> I don't know, kick the doors of the British Museum for the conversations to be had. We've seen with the toppling of the statue, it opened up a conversation about Black Lives Matter because until then, it was all about tokenism. Until something was toppled, then that's when the conversations happened. So, um, aggression, maybe, I don't know. But, um, yeah, but there's, there's, there's a lot of different things that can be done, and I think that I'm doing my bit. So maybe the ominous is on you to ask yourself, you know, what is it that you can physically do? Whether you can maybe 
sponsor, I don't know, an event or, you know, something that uh, to me, the Imagine Festival have been amazing to have a free event that people are online and people are in the room. So that's a medium that I wouldn't have, uh, you know, had any um, experience of to speak publicly about these things and for me to be listened to. Also, I have to thank my publisher who had a leap of faith in me to, to think that this book would be uh, Doya Press, this book would be relevant. You know, they had to trust that this book would be relevant to the readership, which is, I hope it is. So there's, there's trickle of things that, that are happening. And I know that there's a lot of organizations that are already doing groundwork in terms of challenging what's happening, as, as Kamni was saying, about the rallies and toppling of statues. So there are things, I, 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 where I don't want us to leave this is thinking that Irish people didn't colonize anyone. You know, and uh, to, that's a dangerous narrative to have because, uh, especially in, in Northern Ireland, if it's part of the UK, then it has benefited hugely. It's still benefiting, you know. So we have to ask ourselves, where is this, you know, money coming from? And it's still the interest of what was stolen and looted. Okay. Any more questions? about asking that what what we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very fundamental question mm -hmm. that we can actually reflect on. And I can say that um, I don't think the perpetrators are ready for conversation. I don't think they are ready for solution. I don't think they are ready to change narrative because they are still enjoying what they stole from from us. And as long as they are still enjoying it and they are not ready to give it out, I don't know how conversation can solve that problem. We've seen how much the artifacts in, from Africa in, our, in London Museum, we know how much it generates. Mm -hmm. We know how the UK government negotiated with America, the New York, to return the materials from the Titanic to bring them back to Northern Ireland. So quickly, the negotiation of returning those stuff from, from the Titanic yeah. back to Belfast, it was so rapid because friends know how to talk to themselves. But when it comes to the issue of Africans, when it comes to the issue of what they stole from us, we've been having this conversation. A lot of people have done a lot of credible work in terms of research, in terms yeah. of lobbying, yeah. to see how those things can can be returned. But it seems a uh, conversation to me, I don't think it can solve the problem because people are not ready. And there's a king in Nigeria, he took an action to build uh, a museum in Nigeria with the hope that stuff that was stolen would be back. returned. I laugh yeah. because it's not going to happen. Yeah, but For also we now. have yeah we have to turn it on its head as well. You say that the perpetrators are not uh, willing to return, but also you have to understand that the perpetrators uh, did or oh, they stole and who has benefited. Yeah, so it's the ordinary Joe blogs as well who has benefited. So when you look at you even trickle it down to the very basic, uh, for example, the benefit system, you know. People are getting benefits, and in, in Africa, people are not getting benefits. Where's the money coming from? So, it will, you know, it will take you to even look into that and how it starts from the bottom and it moves up, and how this money is trickling down. So, as long as people think that uh, the people that took all these things or are benefiting from are up there in the palace and not themselves, then that's where the gap is, and that's where the gap is in terms of thinking how this can be. And, and to be quite honest, you know, when 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 Britain um, looted all these countries, the people here lived a good life from what they used to, you know, 
what back in the 1700s and the 1600s to the po to poverty of Britain used to be. So it, 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 it benefited people and people all of a sudden now can afford things because of what you know their forefathers did. And in some extent, you know, it's good for them and it, it's bad for Africans, yes. And then Africa will always be portrayed as, you know, as the ones who are, are, are poor and starving. And that image has always been there, you know, in the Troika boxes, in the adverts on the TV. And those adverts are still running till this day. So you have to think about how the media and how who is benefiting from not just up there and thinking that the people that are benefiting up there sitting in their palaces, but they are down here as well. And how we go to move together in addressing this legacy. Yes, Do you feel that there are other other parts of the UK and Ireland, other than Northern Ireland, that are getting this more right than we are in Northern Ireland? That they're getting? That are that are understanding this conversation better than people in Northern Ireland are, and. In, what would be your reasons for saying yes or no? It's a difficult question because if people are getting it, then why do we have direct provision? You know, and you, you only need to answer that question yourself when you look at the response of, you know, to, for, to the Ukrainian crisis. So it turns out that you know, Europe didn't have a, a, a refugee crisis, it had a racism crisis. Because people mobilized, you know, people raised 50 million a day and all that, which is something that was never done for brown people who are refugees and coming here and are still dying. So it's, it's not a matter of, um, because for me, until we, we, we talk or we solve, we close down the, the direct provisions in Ireland, then we're in a position to say that Ireland has progressed and then we can compare that. But as long as uh, we, we are, I don't know, we are othering people, and we are enablers of that. We are enablers of that. We're not angry enough to go and, and shut down those direct provision centers. It's the 20th year, and yet the Ukrainian refugees will never be in those direct provision centers because, I don't know, maybe it's the color of their skin, but they will never be in that because there's a system for them that is it, it, that works. And you ask yourself, why didn't the system work for 20 years? You know, so, and that's just to answer a question. But um, yeah, there are so many, you know, there are so many things that are so subtle as well that we don't see. Of course, we are all, you know, in solidarity with what's happening in, in Ukraine. But when you look at it and you see the response, you think, are people responding to people that are white like them? As it's been said on the internet, you know, they are like us, with meaning that they've got white skin and blue eyes. And why are people not responding when people don't have white skin and blue eyes is the question. Thank you very much, Nandi, for um, sharing your, your experiences. Um, I admire your depth and your determination and your passion for making this book after so long, 10 years, you said into it. Um, also sort of like empathize with the thought for future generations because I'm very much like that myself. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was going to say on a more you know, positive note, hopefully, you were driven to write this book, but which part which part of it did you really enjoy doing? And the second part of my question is, what next for you after this book? Okay. Given that this is the Imagine Festival and we're to imagine a better future, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's very personal that you're coming through it. So I'm wondering, for you personally, you know, which part did you enjoy from writing this book after 10 years? Okay, so I enjoyed the part that said sent. <laughs> Joke, <laughs> jokingly, uh, so I, <laughs> I enjoyed uh, dedicating the book. And in the book it says to my Irish child, my black Irish child who had to endure stereotypes and racism. As I always say that I didn't choose Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland chose me. I didn't know where Northern Ireland was, and I just came to it. And it was just by, um, I believe that I, I had to come here. And when I came here, I, I, I really discovered why I had to come here. So there's a lot of uh, connections between South Africa and Northern Ireland. We know Mandela Hall. 
We know Mandela on the Peace Wall. We know Mandela Street. There's a lot, you know, dance stores, uh, anti-apartheid movement and all of that. And it took me to come here to learn about all that because that was not taught in, 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 in school or anyway in, in growing up in South Africa. So it was a learning as well because I wanted to, to do justice to my people. I wanted to do justice to my name, uh, to my culture, and all of these things, these answers were here. So that's the part I enjoyed, to interact with people that have met Winnie Mandela and told me you know, who she was and uh, as, a, as a person that I admire uh, and, look up, and looked up to. So I enjoyed all of these conversations and I enjoyed people challenging me on some of the things that I held dear, uh, like uh, for example, Winnie Mandela. And, you know, and I, I don't shy away from that because I, these are my personal experiences and then I can compare them with universal experiences and I, we can draw narratives and parallels. So it's okay to disagree with what I say, but as long as we have an understanding that some of the things, these are, as Maria McManus has written at the back of this book, that this is a book of belonging. These are lived poems, yeah? And it challenges the definitions of ourselves and doesn't flinch. So to me, this is about how startling, brutalizing, and othering humanity can be which goes back to what I was saying about refugee crises and how we respond. Do we respond to people because they look like us or do we respond because it's a humanitarian crisis? So to me, I think what I've enjoyed about it is this, it's, it's the actual finding the answers that were waiting here for me all this time. And I was looking for answers all my life in South Africa and they were not there, they were here. And then what's next? Uh, I have a collection of essays which is gone in print. So I've written a, uh, an essay called Impermanence Way, which is in Paris at the moment. And it was the relationship uh, or comparisons that I, I'm using uh, in terms of what I'm learning from my MA. So I wrote about connections between what I think I have in common with Shema Hini, for example, about the border and whatever you say, say nothing. It's a thing that we grew up with as well. So that's next. And also I'm hoping to get into UU to do my PhD in September. So if anybody from UU is watching, please. <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping for. So my thesis is uh, 18th century Black Atlantic in Europe. And uh, I'm looking it through the eyes of Sarah Batman, who was um, trafficked here and was sold and her body was, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If there's no more questions, then I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> but I don't want to leave it on that note. Is there anything else you'd like me to share that has been happy about Northern Ireland? Um, this is my niece, Ima. <laughs> and uh, Ima and Anessa are best of friends, and they grew up in Poglas, uh, Pongladesh, it's now called, I think. Uh, I don't know why. It's Ask Ima's mom, Nolan. But I've had... The past 20 years, I've lived here for 20 years, and the past 20 years have been great in terms of there's always been a person there in every step of the way. Whether I was crazy, Eileen was there when she saw my crazy side of me. <laughs> and when I was trying to get at Queen's, there was always somebody there to help me. We've got Dr. Hillary here, uh, Morgan Ventura, who has been like kicking my, my English when it came to my proposal for the PhD, so thank you for putting things together. But there's always great help, and I don't want to leave a negative, but I want to say the Irish people are the best people in the world. Thank you.